In work and outside of work, there is a really big risk that we try to make work the sole source of our fulfillment. So I think what we want to do is find balanced sources of fulfillment. Yes, a lot of it's going to come from work because you spend a lot of time from work, but it is why we want to think about well, what am I doing outside of work as well? How else am I finding that fulfillment? Helen Tupper. Yeah is one of the co-authors of this excellent book, The Squiggly Career, Ditch the Ladder, Discover Opportunity, Design Your Career. And it's basically an episode that is all about how to figure out what to do with your working life, i.e. your career, and how to navigate what she calls squiggly careers, which is sort of the windy type of career that most of us are going to have these days. It's about not being limited by a ladder, not thinking that the only way is up and that the only destination in terms of success is becoming more senior. Once we get rid of those constraints, is actually quite liberating for people. I feel like I learned so much about my own values and my own strengths and what I value from a career. And so we start off the conversation kind of discussing this idea of squiggly careers and where they've come from. And then we spend the rest of the episode discussing five key skills that you can build today to help navigate a squiggly career. So we start by talking about values finding, and that's really good. We talk about strengths, we talk about confidence, networking in an effective way and exploring the future possibility. A lot of people are motivated by getting more money. But it's almost like, well, what's the meaning behind the more money? Is it giving you status? Is it giving you significance? When you work out the meaning behind the money, you can actually unhook some of your sort of dependency on the pay. Hey friends, so before we get into the episode, I've got some very exciting news that I'm finally able to share with you. And that is that I have written a book now, if you've been following the podcast for a while, you'll probably know from some of my conversations with authors in particular that it's been quite the journey over the last three years. This has been the single hardest thing that I've ever done in my life, but after three years, it's finally here, and I'm delighted to announce that my book, Feel Good Productivity, is now available for pre-order. It's going to be published later this year, and you can find a link down in the video description, or if you head over to feelgoodproductivity.com, all one word, uh, you can check out the website and the website is absolutely sick. Now, the central idea for the book came from a realization that I had while I was working as a doctor a few years ago and trying to juggle everything with my YouTube channel and my business. And I kind of realized that the secret to productivity isn't discipline, it's in fact joy. And sure, hard work and grit and willpower and determination and all of those things are good in small doses. But for most of us, they tend not to be the sustainable route to consistent productivity. But I realized through a lot of experimentation and then diving into a bunch of research that actually the secret to productivity that feels enjoyable and meaningful and sustainable is to find a way to make your work feel good, to find a way to make it feel energizing and enjoyable. And if you do that, you'll be more productive in your work, but you'll also have way more energy to give to the other things in your life that matter to you. And this isn't just my own personal experience, but it's an idea that's been validated by a bunch of studies in the fields of psychology and neuroscience as well. And so the writing process of the book over the last three years has involved reading hundreds of research papers, interviewing academics and experts in the fields of like psychology and procrastination and motivation, and spending years trying to condense it into a format and cut out all the fluff and trying to do it in a way that's like engaging and actionable at the same time. So that's what the book is about. It is a science-backed guide on how to do more of what matters to you in a way that feels enjoyable and meaningful and sustainable. And if you enjoy this podcast, then I can basically guarantee that you will love the stuff that's in the book. Uh, there are nine chapters. Each chapter has six different experiments in it that you can try out in your own life. And so there are 54 different experiments, strategies that you can apply to your life starting from as soon as you read the book. And the idea is that you apply these and you see if they work for you. And over time, you'll build your own feel-good productivity system. Now, if you do decide to pre-order the book, then that would be awesome because firstly, it helps me out. And secondly, I think the ideas in this book can be genuinely life-changing. And if you pre-order the book, it will be delivered straight to you on release date later this year, but to your Kindle or your Audible account. And I'm narrating the audiobook, by the way, uh, or to the hardback hardback version of the book if you prefer to read physical copies of books. And if you do pre-order, then please do be sure to save your receipts because I'm going to be announcing a bunch of really exciting pre-order bonuses exclusively and only for people who pre-order the book. And so final thing before we get into the episode is just want to say a massive thank you to you guys by watching the videos, by subscribing on social media, by listening to the podcast. You have made this book possible. Um, without you guys supporting the channel and everything that I do, there's no way Penguin would have come knocking and been like, hey, do you want to write a book? And so I'm like, this has been like such a rewarding experience and I could not have come to this point without your support. So I just wanted to say massive thank you from the bottom of my heart for that. So that's it from me. Do check out the book if you like at feelgoodproductivity.com. It'll be linked down below in the podcast description and the show notes as well. But now let's get into the podcast episode itself. Helen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're going to be talking about the squiggly career and the idea of like how to how to build a career that you actually love. Yeah. And like the twisty, turny, squiggly path along the way. Um, before we dive into that, I'd just love to hear from people who might not be familiar with who you are. Can you give us a quick like 
summary of how you, how we ended up here. Oh gosh, the quick the quick uh, <laughs> squiggly path. Uh, so I used to work for lots of large organisations, uh, mainly in marketing. And about 10 years ago, so 2013, uh, me and a friend that had gone to university together were reflecting a little bit on our careers. Uh, they'd started quite ladder-like, like so ladder-like that I did three graduate schemes after the other because I just love that like ready-made incentive of progression that they come with. Um, but then we started to realize together that our careers have been going in lots of different directions and uh, we were really enjoying what we were doing and developing a lot. Um, but we realized that other people were still stuck on this ladder. Like mm. they hadn't been able to develop in different directions. And we decided we just wanted to help people. Uh, take what we had learned, what was helping us and support other people to succeed in careers that were a bit more individual. Um, and then the more we did that, it started with evening sessions. So while we were doing our five day a week job, uh, we would go train people in the evening and that stuff just started to stick and people started to share it. And this business sort of grew that became a book and it became a podcast and it became a big training company. And sort of 10 years on from that moment, that's what we do today. We have a team um, helping people scale squiggly um, all over the world and uh, supporting them with their skills. Wow. That's a great pitch. <laughs> um, what What is a squiggly career? Oh, what is a squiggly career? It is a career where people can develop in different directions. So you don't have to be defined by the last job that you did. Um, you have freedom and flexibility to develop in a way that's right for you. That can be in the same company or the same industry. Sometimes people think squiggly is about, you know, making dramatically different changes to their career. Um, things like you've done, for example, you've had a quite an extreme squiggly career, but you can still squiggle and stay in a company. It's about not being limited by a ladder, not thinking that the only way is up and that the only destination in terms of success is becoming more senior. Once we get rid of those constraints, it's actually quite liberating for people because I can go sideways because I don't have to worry that that's a bad move or I could go back to something I did before and it's not a failure for my future. And people just become much more open and start looking inward what do I actually want from work rather than outward what does good look like on the surface and surface level stuff doesn't often make people that happy it's the inward stuff that's better mm. what 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 is a career these days like how do we understand that word yeah what is a career I think a career is a collection of jobs we do throughout our time at work. That's all a career is to me. It's the, it's the journey of the jobs. Um, what we are trying to say is if you have a squiggly career, that journey of the jobs um, gives you more choice and it gives you more freedom. Whereas if you have a ladder-like career, a, a journey of jobs, that journey is only going in one direction and you are going to have a limited amount of control about what that looks like. Because when the journey looks like a ladder, what a lot of people do is they have to wait for promotions because mm. that's that's how you progress on a ladder. Whereas when the journey looks squiggly, you are creating more possibility for your future rather than sort of waiting for somebody else to gift you that promotion. Mm. Is the idea of squiggly confined to, like, like for example, I'm thinking in medicine, it's fairly ladder-like, mm. but... Then I know a lot of people who have squiggly, squiggly careers within medicine as well. Um, do you see examples of people within a more traditionally hierarchical field ending up creating a squiggly career for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. So, gosh, we work with lawyers. We work with, actually, we do quite a lot of work with um, media companies uh, who uh, are, I would say, very um, siloed sometimes in the skills. Like They kind of go, well, I'm, I'm an editor, therefore I can't go into that function. So we, we deal with lots of different organizations and industries that are traditionally more ladder-like. Um, and actually, because of their expertise, like I've, there's a an international organization we work with, with ingredient specialists, like they have PhDs and all kinds of things that I don't understand. They don't necessarily want to go and become a teacher you know they're actually quite happy with their phd expertise but the point of squiggly is it goes beyond a job title so we're trying to think about your talent so okay yes you've got your phd and yes you're some molecular scientist in this area whatever it is but what is your talent like specifically what do you want to be known for what gives you the most energy at work and how can we find ways for you to stretch that strength so you can still do the job that you're currently doing but if you look at your career in a squiggly way what you're thinking is well if that's what gives me energy that's what I want to be known for then how can I build that beyond the job that I'm in today how can I build relationships beyond the ones I have today because the more we get beyond the thing we're in today the more opportunities we create for our future but in that ladder-like way of thinking we don't really go beyond where we are today yeah. because we're just just doing the job and waiting often for someone else to give us those things 
So are we talking like side hustles and stuff or like what's the, how, how does one go about exploring oh, these? So, yeah. so let's, let's take strengths, for example, just for a moment. So if I'm, if I'm thinking, okay, so I, I want to be known by my talents and not my titles. Um, it's a much kind of broader way of think, people thinking about their development. And so um, I don't know, what is one of the talents you want to be known for? Um, I don't know, let's say songwriting. Okay, songwriting. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love that. Potentially, <laughs> it's, it's not a talent yet, but okay. I would like it to be. Okay, become brilliant. One. So we want to try and stretch that strength as much as possible. The more people and places you use that strength in, the better. The better it's going to become. Mm. So we might start thinking about in your day job today. Yeah. How can you do more songwriting? Maybe you could write the intro, uh, the intro music for your podcast. That would be a sort of a very relevant way of stretching mm. that strength. Then we might think a little bit more broadly. Um, how could you help some other people by stretching that? strength so could you volunteer are there i don't know music charities organizations that you could contribute to could you get involved in schools so this is where you get into the role of side hustles or volunteering and you stretch your strengths i i really like people to stretch their strengths within their organizations as far as possible because the more people within your organization that can see your strengths the more they will spot opportunities for you mm. but we want we want it in and outside of the organization, different people, different places, because the way of thinking about it, I think, is, is frequency builds competency. More you use it, better you're going to get. And openness leads to opportunity. So the more people that see it, the more people that are going to spot for you. And if we can just keep that stretch going, it starts to build your brand. You become known for that talent and the, the good stuff comes to you. Mm. Love it. Okay. I have so many more questions <laughs> about the strength stuff. Uh, but be be before we go there, um, where does this idea of like ladder career progression come from? Yeah, it's so it's over a hundred years old as a as a concept. Um, apparently, started in the financial services sector. That's the origins of the career ladder. Financial services sector mainly for managers. Apparently, early nineteen hundreds, there were uh, I think a big growth in clerical workers, uh, and managers were trying to create some conformity over careers so they could manage and motivate a rapidly growing workforce. That was kind of the origins of the ladder. Um, I'm not sure conformity and control are the ingredients for like happy careers, but you know, that ladder stuck around for a very long time, but you know, it, it leads to lots of problems now. So that thing that was created a hundred years ago for one context, mainly for managers, um, has sort of been extrapolated into lots of different environments and situations. And the world that we're working in now is very, very different. So we are not working in this predictable world. Like most people are gonna do multiple roles in multiple companies and have multiple careers. Like mm. it's, it's, it's a very much change. Um, people also identify with work a lot more. It's not so much kind of clocking in and clocking out. It's much bigger part of our identity, which means we ask questions like, well, purpose i mean purpose it's just the concept of having work with purpose is quite a new thing for people making a difference meaning at work they are important things for us to consider but they lead to very different responses from different people so with this ladder-like notion what we're doing is forcing everyone to fall into one definition of success and meaning you know become more senior get yeah. to the top um and it leads to lots of people actually competing with each other in, 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 in careers for roles they might not actually want. It leads to quite a lot of comparison. So I might look at you as someone who is successful and think, well, I need to be like you. And if I'm not doing what you're doing, then I'm not successful rather than actually thinking, what does success mean to me? And um, lots of people lose confidence. It's this thing that's been around for such a long time. People think, well, if my career doesn't look like that, then I'm obviously not doing it right. Mm. You get this like the right career, the wrong choice, very binary. Um, and it's just not that, it's just not that binary. Like we all make different moves. We all learn from different things and we should be using that to inform what we do next. It's mm. not good and bad moves. That that limits people making choices when they think every move has to, it's almost, it's almost like this sort of, progression perfectionism which is is holding people back from experimenting and exploring and just becoming a bit more self-aware where does this idea come from that we're like every move we make we have to go upwards in this sort of metaphorical well, I think, world i think i mean i think it's been baked in by the ladder i think yeah. it was introduced and then we've sort of reinforced companies so we've created organizational structures upon this concept like i've i've seen it experienced it and actually I have been motivated by it because it is, it's a ready-made achievement for you. You know, mm. it, the promise is you show up, you work hard and you will go up that ladder. And when that is true, I think it's quite motivating for people that, you know, I have a value of achievement. So for me, 
to some extent that becomes quite motivating. But then you get to a point where that level of promotion isn't possible anymore because they don't come around that frequently or the organization's going through a period of restructuring and suddenly you're left going, oh, well, am I not, am I not successful now? Um, is Am I doing something wrong? And it's not that you're doing something wrong and it's not that you're not successful and it's not that you can't keep developing. It's just that very limited way of looking at career success and how to develop yourself starts to hold you back. And and that's the thing, we are not anti-ambition. I'm not anti people becoming more senior. But what I'm saying is if you become so blinkered about your career, that the only way you can progress is by getting promoted. And the only thing that is success is becoming more senior, then at some point you are going to become disillusioned about your development. And I, I don't want that for people because I think work is such an important part of people's life mm. that if we are selling this story that success is becoming more senior for everybody, we create a situation where I think a lot of people are unhappy at work. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Um, there's a friend of mine, uh, Paul Millard, who wrote a book called The Pathless Path, mm. which is kind of like, you know, he had a sort of corporate, big four corporate, sort of a management consulting um, career. And after about 10 years of that, decided to completely quit his job and now just like, you know, you know, free internet freelancing and all this kind of stuff. And in the book, he talks a lot about how he had to deal with all of the societal and corporate pressures around like, oh, like I can no longer go out for drinks with the coworkers because they're buying $100 cocktails and I can't afford that anymore. And all, all of the things, things around that. But one of the things he talks about, um, he calls it the accidental meaning hypothesis, okay. uh, which is basically like in the 1950s or thereabouts, because of these career ladders, um, it was the case that you worked hard at a job, you got promoted, you got the company car, you lived in the same place, you probably lived in the suburbs, you probably went to church, you probably had a house with a white picket fence, you probably had like three point X kids and you were probably married and you were involved in the local community. And as a result of the way societies were structured, at least in the West, in that context, you were actually leading a pretty meaningful and fulfilled life because you were progressing in your work by default because of seniority and uh, time. And you had meaning outside of your work by community and structure and like hanging out with the friends and family and things. Whereas increasingly now, it's like the career thing no longer works because very few jobs are, have that linear progression. But also we're all increasingly living in apartments in big cities, we're increasingly moving around, the world's becoming smaller. And so we have less of that community side going on for us as well, which somewhat necessitates us putting a lot of pressure on our jobs to fulfill the meaning and purpose questions of life. Yeah, and I think that 1950s scenario as well, uh, I think men's success in that situation was very enabled by the women painting the picket fence at home. Yep. And so as we have no longer have that kind of narrative, I think suddenly you can't necessarily have that that kind of system of family life. It's just different. And I ultimately think it's better because now we have more equal opportunities in the workplace. However, it doesn't make it easy. Like it doesn't make it easy to sort of balance all those things together. Um, but yeah, I can see, I will, I will have a look at his work. Sounds very interesting. <laughs> um what do you think, so the the people that you speak to during, in like th through the course of your work, do you have a sense of like what proportion of people are totally happy with their career path versus, like in increasingly I find a lot of my friends saying, I don't really know what I'm doing with my career. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like everyone kind of feels that, but everyone f feels like they're the only person who feels that. Yeah, um, it's, re it's really interesting. I would say the majority of people um, are thinking about their development and whether they're doing the right thing. And that doesn't mean they're going to do something different. That doesn't mean that they're going, and I want to leave my company and I want to, you know, retrain to do something else. It just means that they are reflecting on work and life and does it feel right for them right now? I hear it, I hear a lot of that. And I think people just need to make sense. They make, need to make sense of what's going on. And if you can help them to make sense, okay, well, well, let's look at what's making you happy at work, your values, and let's look at what you want to be known for. Um, and let's look at who's helping you grow so you don't feel like you're doing this on your own. Like lots of things that we talk about. Then sometimes you can go through that process and they become self-aware. And they're like, actually, this, this is the right thing for me right now, but I'm more confident in what I'm doing and why I'm doing. It's the unknown and the uncertainty that people really struggle with. And so I think a lot of a lot of what we're trying to do is to to create clarity and give people confidence about the direction of their development. And that might be, actually, I'm in a good place. Or that might be, I want to do something different. But 
so many people don't have the support. That was why we started the business because what we realized was in lots of organizations, you get to a level of seniority that unlocks career support. So you're like, congratulations on becoming a director. Here's your executive coach. Mm. And then you go through this epiphany about, about your, your life and your career and you make decisions. And you're like, well, everybody's going through that uncertainty. Your friends, my friends, the people, everyone's going through those, that, those thought processes. So why are we only helping senior people later in their career to make sense of it? Why don't we take the questions and the tools and the frameworks and just give them to everybody? Mm. Like democratize development, don't limit it by level. And then surely everyone can start to succeed in their careers at whatever success means for them. So yeah, those... That that conversation from the friend and the colleague and the mentor saying the same thing, like, oh, I don't really know what I want to do either. That was the starting point for Squiggly. It was, it was that that we thought, well, let's just try and help people because we had those questions and we found some things that have helped us. So let's just try and share that with as many people as possible. Nice. Sick. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the five skills to navigate the Squiggly career. Yeah. Um, but before we go there, um, what, how... What's your sense of how, how do people end up in jobs that they thought they would enjoy, but that they end up actually not enjoying? <laughs> uh, I think we, a combination of a lack of self-awareness and a lot of shiny objects. Okay, <laughs> so let me, I think that the lack of self-awareness is we, we don't necessarily reflect for very long, unless you read the book, on the things that ha make you happy, the things that motivate and drive you. So we um, make quick choices. We sort of bounce around from one job to the next, hoping that we will find out what makes us happy once we've got there. Uh, and I think if we could spend a little bit more time reflecting on what makes us happy before we get there, then we can make better decisions about our development. So I think self-awareness is a, is, a, is a big thing. We just need to support people with a little bit of reflection before they move into new roles. Mm. Um, I think shiny objects is also another thing and I have definitely succumbed to these. So this is where it's surface level stuff. So it's um, grades, like when you're in uh, large organisations, it's the, oh, I'm at a, a B level and I could get to the C level. Um, um, and we kind of get very attached to grades. It's shiny objects, like literal ones, like cars. Like I once took a job because of the car it came with. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, nice. Definitely. And I remember sitting in my shiny car thinking, hmm, I'm not sure this job's really making me happy, but I'll just put the radio on in my car. So, you know, there's lots of shiny objects. I think salaries to, to some extent can be a shiny object. Like everyone has a, a base level of pay that they need for their life. And then I think there's money beyond that that can become discretionary and shiny and impressive. It's sort of these status symbols of um, ladder-like progression. And when we haven't really reflected on what we want or we don't feel confident about the choices we're making, defaulting to things that seem shiny on the surface um, can be quite persuasive, as can other people's opinions and expectations. Ooh. So if I am unsure about what to do and you're my manager or you're someone in my family or my partner and you're very you know, clear about your opinion, I might default to what you think I should do with my development. And so you have this situation where you've got sort of lack of self-awareness, lots of shiny objects and perhaps other people's opinions and expectations. And I think that is creating unclear career decision making where people move into a position and then ultimately find out that it's not the right thing for them. Um, and we just have to press pause on that stuff and help people to get there themselves to sort of, you know, to look inward on those things and use that to make the decisions for their development. Damn, love it. Um, what are the, what are the ways in which we can do that reflection, reflection thing? Like someone watching or listening to this now, what sort of questions would you be asking or should, or could they be asking themselves to figure out what is the career that will actually help me become happier? Well, I think it depends where you want to start, really. That's why we, we when we talk through the five skills, yeah. they are all equally important in getting to that, like, where do I want to go and how do I want to grow and how am I going to get there? They mm. are all equally important. But I would say they're not all equally important to all the people all the time. So, for example, if I'm, let's say I'm in a role that I'm really not enjoying at the moment and I have been in this position and you're not really sure why. You're like, it's a good job. I'm paid a, a good salary. I sh like, I should be happy. I don't know yeah. what I want to do. And I don't know why I'm not happy. For that person, I would say, work on your values first. There is no point you moving to another position until you've reflected on like what motivates and drives you. And you know, there's a whole series of exercises that can help people there. If you've got somebody else who's saying, I just want to do something different. 
like I do like my job, but I'm like, oh, I feel like I, my career has been a bit constrained. I want to try something out. That person who's quite excited, you know, they're not lost. They're quite excited about the potential of their progression. Mm. I would say, let's go explore some career possibilities. Before you start doing just loads of random things, because you've got all this energy and enthusiasm, why don't we proactively explore some possibilities, have some curious career conversations, collect some data for your development, and then use that to make a decision. So for that person, I'd be saying, well, let's look at future. Let's look at future possibilities and, and sort of start you working on that skill. So I don't think there's a one size fits all question for this. I don't think there's like a and the squiggly career question everyone should ask themselves. I don't think there is that. I think there is, where are you right now? And what's the skill that's going to be most relevant for you? And helping people to spot the skill and invest in that. Otherwise, it's really overwhelming. Like trying to yeah. do all this stuff at once. Like I don't want to overwhelm people with career development. I want to give them specific stuff that could support them to succeed. And I think that is a very individual way of managing it. Nice. Okay. So I wonder if we start with the values thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've got a question from Henry from our Telegram community. He says, um, let's say you're in a corporate job and you feel numb from the daily grind. Hmm. You're relatively good at the job, but you're looking to find something that excites you. How do you go about this discovery process? And he's also asking, how do you balance the monetary value of the corporate job with kind of exploring other other options? That's a numb from the corporate grind. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's a, like, wow. a motivating statement to start the day with. <laughs> um, so first of all, we just need to take a bit of time to think about, okay, well, what motivates and drives me? I think one of the easiest ways of doing this is to, um, we kind of call it the career graph exercise, but you, you're you going to reflect on your career so far. And some people have had quite a lot of experience. Some people might have a year if you've come off you know, out of university, you might not have loads of time. That's fine. Um, I want you to start wherever you think your career started to where you are today and just sort of unravel the squiggle into a series of highs and lows. Um, so I'd be talking about my career started on the Boots Graduate Scheme in Nottingham and and just describe it. And I would have, I would say, okay, that was actually a high for me. And you might go, well, why was it a high? And because I was with lots of keen people and we're doing lots of new things and I got a lot of variety because I changed every six months, et cetera, et cetera. And then I moved into something else, got my shiny car, but I wasn't very happy. Well, why weren't you very happy? And you kind of unravel the career into a series of highs and lows and really start to probe the points in time that were particularly high and particularly low. Yeah. And the, the questions, it's sort of like, why was it high? What can you learn from the low? Um, specifically, I would, I would get people thinking, well, who are you working with? And not, not someone's name necessarily, it, it was Jane. It, it's more the characteristics. Were they entrepreneurial? Were they curious? Like what, what are some of the words that come out? Or um, what were you working on? Like a day in your life when I was on the Boots Graduate Scheme, what was that like? Describe the detail. What we're doing when we're analyzing these points in time is we're collecting clues because your values are present when you're really happy. So I'm trying to collect those clues. Like what was there when I was loving that job what was present and then what was missing when you weren't like when i think about some of my career lows a lot of it is because i was working in very process driven organization um with very sort of siloed thinking kind of people mm. who were quite um aggressive in their approach like when i think about some of the places i've worked and my values are freedom growth and energy and achievement and so what i can see was missing in those moments was i didn't have the freedom because it was so process driven and the energy that i need wasn't there because people were so um <laughs> aggressive in their approach and so those roles didn't make me happy because i couldn't get that from my work so for henry I would say, draw your career graph, like map out those moments and probe the points in time that stand out, the goods, the goods and the bad. That will get you to a set of clues and you want to spot the consistencies. What three or four words or themes really, really stand out. Um, and that's a starting place for your values. There's more you can do, but it's a pretty good starting place as to what makes you, you. Then what we want to do is try and get those fulfilled as much as possible. In work and outside of work, mm -hmm. I think there is a really big risk that we try to make work the sole source of our fulfillment. And that's where you start to risk enmeshment, which is where I go, well, I now know that freedom, growth, energy, and achievement are what makes me me. So I'm going to try and you know get as much as I can of that for my work. I'm going to try and get all of it from my work. And then what happens when me and my manager aren't getting on or you know, there's a, I've hit a road 
bump for my business is my achievement value goes from green to red straight away and my entire happiness is affected as a result. So I think what we want to do is find balance sources of fulfillment. Yes, a lot of it's going to come from work because you spend a lot of time from work, but it is why we want to think about well, what am I doing outside of work as well? How else am I finding that fulfillment? It means you are less likely to be affected by the changes at work. Um, and also for Henry as well, talking about the money. So Henry now knows his values. He now knows that maybe find some of that stuff outside of work as well as inside of work. Um, the money thing, balancing the, the the money that you might get from a role with the meaning that you might want from your work. And um, I would suggest that you need to think about sort of the meaning behind the money. A lot of people are motivated by getting more money. But it's almost like, well, what's the meaning behind the more money? Is it giving you status? Is it giving you significance? Is it giving you security? Like, why, why, why do you want more money? Is it freedom? Like for me, a lot of the time for me, yes, I want more money, but not, not so it's in the bank. That's not what it is. It's because I can do new things. When you work out the meaning behind the money, you can actually unhook some of your sort of dependency on the pay like I, I obviously pay is important because there are certain things we pay for in our life but it's that discretionary stuff if you are stuck on a ladder becoming more senior because you want to get paid more I think that can become quite dangerous for people's happiness because it's not always the pay that's making them happy it's the meaning behind the money so find out the meaning behind the money and then just just see if there's other ways that you can find that fulfillment or next time there's a pay, pay freeze you're going to feel really really unhappy and it, it's likely that money means more than just what you're, what's going into your bank. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Huel. I've been a paying customer of Huel since my fifth year of medical school, since 2017, actually since before I started my YouTube channel. And I first started using Huel because my life was pretty hectic. I was juggling lots of different things like medical school and exams and trying to sort out publication points for my future like doctor job applications. And alongside I was running a business, I was building an app and I was trying to maintain some semblance of a social life. And so Huel actually came in really handy for that. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically a meal in a shake that contains all of the ingredients that are essential to thrive. It's got a perfect balance of protein and carbs and fats and vitamins and minerals. And these days, the Huel Black Edition is my absolute favorite. It comes in nine flavors. Salted caramel is my personal favorite. And the Huel Black Edition is particularly good because it is a higher protein version than the Huel Original. It was the original that I was using back in 2017, but the Black Edition came out a few years ago. Changed the game because it's 40 grams of protein for 400 calories. I'm trying to get hench, and so I'm keeping an eye on like my protein intake. And it's so nice that I can get that high protein hit as the first thing in the morning. Huel is also very affordable. It comes out to £1.68 per meal for a 400 calorie meal, which is actually way cheaper than most of the other options on the market and certainly way cheaper than other, you know, even standalone protein shakes. Like I said, I've been a paying customer of Huel since 2017. My friends literally make fun of me as to how much Huel I have in the house. And they're like, what? You have all this Huel? I'm like, yeah, it's actually so good. So if you're interested in signing up for Huel, then head over to huel.com forward slash deep dive. And if you use that URL, A, it helps us out because then they're keen to sponsor more episodes. Episodes. But B, you get a completely free t-shirt and a free shaker with your order. So that is hopefully an incentive to use Huel.com forward slash deep dive. And actually, I interviewed the founder of Huel, Julian Hearn, on this very podcast in the very first season. So you can check out that episode if you like. It's got rave reviews, really good episode, all about starting and growing a business. So anyway, thank you so much, Huel, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested £100 into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your Trading212 account. You can use Apple Pay, like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. The other really cool feature about Trading212 is their pies feature. So what you can do is you can follow people who've created investing pies. For example, someone might have a pie where, I don't know, 30% of it's Apple and 20% is Tesla and 10% is the S&P 500. And you can follow people on the app and see what pies they've created. And you can see the performance of those pies. And then you can just copy and paste a particular pie into your own account. And so that means like, let's say you've got hundred pounds to invest and you've put 50 of it into the S&P 500, but you want to be a little bit more experimental with the other 50 pounds, you could invest it into a pie where someone else who's generally a pro or someone in their bedroom who just loves the markets has already done all the homework for you. Also, very excitingly, there's a new feature that they've added to the app, which is a daily interest on your uninvested cash. 
These interest rates may go up or down over time as the economic environment changes, but the cool thing is that you get paid out every single day if you're into that sort of thing. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the App Store and if you use the coupon code ALI, A-L-I, that will give you a totally free share worth up to £100. It's available on iPhone and Android and you can check it out by typing in Trading212 into your respective App Store. So thank you so much Trading212 for sponsoring this episode. There's a good book by Vicky Robin called uh, Your Money or Your Life. Mm. I don't know if you've come across it. I haven't. Oh, it's so good. Uh, it's just like that just completely changed my approach to money when I read it a few, a few years ago. Um, her argument in the book, I mean, it was it was written a couple of decades ago. But, but essentially, the argument in the book is that fundamentally, the only reason we do a job is to make money. And she's like, I know people are going to say fulfillment and meaning and contribution and like learning and all that shit but she's like but you can get all those things outside of a job yeah you can get all of those things by volunteering if you had 100 million in the bank you probably would you might make slightly different you know different decisions with how you spend how you spend your time and therefore money is the thing so let's call a spade a spade a job is fundamentally about money and now when you recognize that it's like cool how much of my life uh, my life force my life energy am i trading for that money um and yeah, to your point around like the freedom, the growth, all, mm. all of those things can actually be found outside of the day job, potentially. Yeah. And I think I just remember a personal pivotal point for me was when, um, so we were building our business in parallel with our careers for yeah. many years. So I was at Microsoft. Um, I was a market director at Microsoft in the UK. Um, and, you know, at this point I had two children and I had my side project and had the podcast and I had the book and all that was kind of going on. And I thought all right, I needed to make a decision. I'd managed all this together for quite a while and I was just becoming I needed to make a choice it was just becoming a bit too much I think the trade-off that I was making in terms of time I was spending with my family and the quality of the work I wanted to do was I could start to see the impact of spreading myself so thin but in order to make the move to do Amazing If my company full-time well I had to let go some identity things like working for a big company I had to let go of that but I also had to halve my salary and again that that to me was a really like pivotal decision where I had to the ladder said become more senior, earn more money, because that's what success is. And I'd been on that ladder for a little while, but actually the squiggly career said, work out what's meaningful and motivating for you, build the support you need around it and, and use that to drive your development. And so that enabled me to have the confidence and clarity to make a move that not everyone agreed with. Yeah. Like, this is madness, Helen. Why are you doing this? You've done it like this way for so long. Just keep doing it like this. But that has been so much better for my development, for my impact, for my happiness. And then I, I think because work does take up such a big part of your life, it has ripples on the people around you too. And I think it has been better for my family. Like, I think my children now see me being very happy at work and they see work in a different way because of that decision I made about my development. And I'm not saying everyone should make that decision, but what I am saying is that if you can put work and money in these slightly different boxes, you know, not yeah. not in the yeah. same, like it's all tied together. If yeah. you just kind of hold them here for a second and just look at them slightly more critically, it can help you to make different choices. Yeah, that's sick. Um, this values thing. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, figure out your values, but like what I liked about the book is that you actually have a step-by-step -step process for how to figure out your values. Um, so just if we stick on this point a bit, I yeah. wonder if we, can we just like talk through it for me? Like yes. how, how would we figure out my values? And I'm, okay. I'm hoping that listeners or viewers can then apply this to their situation. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let me ask you a few questions sure, and then I'll, I'll just kind of collect some insights as I go. Um, in terms of the people that you work with, mm. what's most important to you about those people? If you were going to create your perfect team, what traits and behaviors would you want to, to see in those people? Oh, um energizing uh getting stuff done keen on pushing the envelope entrepreneurial um friendly yeah okay. does that make yeah. sense yeah it okay. does it does okay. yeah. uh, i'm trying to keep it all in my head no pen cool. and paper so kind of energizing uh entrepreneurial effective they're yeah. getting things done so i'll kind of hold those and um, what about the type of work you're doing what's most important if you're designing your perfect day what what's kind of work that you're actually spending your time doing and why mm. if i were designing my perfect day mm -hmm. i really like uh teaching and learning and so if i could spend some proportion of my day learning and growing and then some amount of my day like applying those insights or something and then some amount of my day teaching or sharing those insights through writing or through making videos or through talking to people um more 
through talking to people and making videos rather than writing because writing is kind of <laughs> it's kind of annoying. It feels more contracting rather than expansive. Um, that would be a pretty pretty good day. Okay. Expansive is an interesting word. What does expansive mean to you? Hmm. What does expansive mean to me? Uh, when I'm giving a talk in public, I feel like more open. When I'm sitting at my computer typing shit out on a Google Doc, I feel more closed. That's what I mean by yeah. expansive. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then last thing, in terms of where you work, if you maybe think in your career, the different places that you've worked, the, yeah. the team you're creating now, the company that you're creating now, what's important to you about the culture of those places? Oh, okay. So a friendly, um, casual, um, I remember when working in the hospital, uh, the days that were the most enjoyable were ones where there was this sense of camaraderie with a bit of casualness. So kind of the younger consultants rather than the really old consultants that we were working with who could have a bit of a laugh and we'd go to the doctor's mess together and we'd sort of chat about patients while having some chips or something like that. And that was really nice. And then when I discovered WeWork and I started working from there when, you know, during the pandemic, when I quit the day job, that felt like, oh, this is, this is my happy place. I yeah. just love, freaking love going to a WeWork, which is just like nice and there's free <laughs> coffee and the people are wearing t-shirts and chinos and oh, what, a, what a vibe, <laughs> that kind of thing. Amazing. So what I am, I am listening for the words that you're saying and I'm listening to the way that you say them. Mm. So so when, when people talk about their values, I feel like um, when you're getting really close to it, if you watch people, you can see if like a very physical response. So some people go, oh, I hated it. You know, they'll like, literally they'll they'll use their body like this. They'll come inwards and be like, oh, I hated it in that job. And you're like, oh, oh why? Talk yeah. a bit more about this and I'm just watching the body. When you talk about we work, you get in your words quite very expansive like with your body. You're, you're like, oh, I loved it. There's people, they've got t-shirts and, and you're just getting bigger and you're smileier. So sometimes when you're getting close to what someone's values are, you can literally see it. I can see it in the energy that comes from someone when they talk about it because remember, this is what makes you you. Mm. So when you're in those environments with those people, you're like more Ali, it's more mm. you. Um, or you hear it in repeated words. So there are the words that people just say over and over. So you mentioned um, friendly about three times when you were talking. Oh, did I? Yeah, oh, okay. you talked right. about, oh, yeah. I really like, you know, like friendly people. Yeah. It's important that people are friendly. You, sometimes it's cl like clues in exact words. Sometimes it's like a theme. So um, I, in listening to you describe, there's some sort of theme, I think, something about connection or community. Mm. Like when you talk about the doctor's mess, it's like this community of people, yep. but it's a very... Um, uh, like non-hierarchical, equal, you talk about we work, you know, there's this community of people, everyone's there, I'm bumping in. So I don't know if it would be community or connection, but what I'm trying to spot is these words that you say frequently, the clues as well as some words that are similar, there's a cluster, and then your your body language. And that that's all data. And for me, I'm just like listening and learning. And if I could just get you talking even more, I would get more data, I'd collect mm. more clues. And then it is not my job to say to you, and here are your values, like that, that's your decision. But part of what we're trying to do, and people can do this on their own, or supported by somebody else, is to look at these clues and say, okay, well, what does feel most like me? I'm just presenting you with what you've played back to me, but I'm doing it in a way that creates clarity. So you said words like, um, you talked a lot about um, entrepreneurialism. I thought that expansive word was really interesting. You know, you talked a lot about, I like learning and growing and sharing. And I was like, oh, is that expanding knowledge? Is that your value? Like you're expanding your own knowledge, you're expanding other people's knowledge. Mm. I like to listen out for like, particularly what I think are sticky words, words that other people don't say, because mm. then they're more meaningful and memorable to you. Where it's not like I've ticked it off a list. Like I don't really want people to just go through a list and go, oh yes, I've got a value of ambition and I've got a yes. value of this, you know, you, you might have it, but let's talk about it for a bit longer. What does that word mean to you? Because if I can find the sticky words, mm. it's more likely to stick with you. And then you're more likely to use it when you're thinking about your career. Damn, that's really good. Oh, good, yeah, good. <laughs> it's like you've done this before. Wow, <laughs> I'm just blown away. Um, so is there a list of words that someone could look through and be like, <sighs> Because like... There is, yeah. yes. And it's in the book because yeah. we have to put it in and everyone loves a list. But um, I just want people to think before they tip. You know, I want, I want you to really think about what a brilliant day looks like and what a bad look day looks like. Yeah. And I want you to pick apart those moments and reflect on it. And I want you to talk to someone. I want them to listen to you. And then you can go to a list. But the list should reinforce, you know? So it's, I think, 
use your reflection first mm. and then you can look at a list and you can go oh yeah that was the word i meant yes that that's it that's it or ah oh, i think i've missed that rather than taking one minute to scan through a list of words and going tick 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 and move on like values aren't a tick list they have formed through a lot of your life experience and we need to unpick and reflect upon that in order for us to really like do the work like do the work but it's worth it if you can work out what your values are you will be happier at work you'll make better choices about your development and you'll build better relationships with other people it is worth doing the work so yes there's a list but i'm just gonna encourage everyone to like do do the work first love it um what is a good amount of values to have in one's mind mm, yeah i i would say three to four so if you look in the research of this there's this difference between core values and satellite values so satellite values are basically like the long list of things that are important to you you might have 10 you might you might be okay well i've got entrepreneurialism and i've got achievement and i've got community and i've got knowledge and you know you have this long list but we want to get down to three to four um there's a few ways that you can you could do that I mean, sometimes you can just look at it and be like, it's those. Um, if I just took some words now that you've said to me, yeah. um, these may or may not be your values because you haven't you know, chosen them. But let's say I take the words, uh, some of the words you mentioned. So um, entrepreneurism, uh, community, uh, growth, and I'm going to say friendly because you had that mm. one in there. Mm. So what I could say to you is um, what's more important to you, entrepreneurialism or community? Community. What's more important to you, entrepreneurialism or um, knowledge? Knowledge. What's more important to you, entrepreneurialism or, f or friendly? Friendly. Okay, and then we'd go to the the, the second one yeah. where I'd talk to you about community. What's more important to you, community or entrepreneurialism? Community. What's more important to you, community or friendly? Ooh. Mm. It's kind of the same, maybe. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Hold, They're getting at the similar, yeah. Hold that thought. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then what's more important to you, uh, entrepreneurialism uh, or uh, friendly? Oh, friendly, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I did have a few more words sure, yeah. and I won't be trying to do this all in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I probably have a pen and paper, and I'd be, but I'd be able to see. There, I'm always looking out for a couple of things here. I'm looking out for the noises. So you know when you went, ooh, <laughs> yeah. I, I love an ooh because okay. that means you're going you're really thinking and exactly what you played back to me was they're getting at the same thing brilliant 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 that's a cluster so you said community and you said friendly but to you they're very of course they're different words you look in a dictionary they're different words but to you the meaning of those words mm. is getting at something very very similar yeah and we don't have to worry about the exact word right now. That's yeah. just going to delay us. So we'll just call it community slash friendly. Okay, nice. That's going to just, just hold that thought. Cool. And you just take your list of words and you you score them through exactly like I was doing there. You, you take the first word, score them across all of them and the next yeah. one. We're basically ranking them all against each other to work out what rises to the top. Yeah. The ones that rise to the top, that's the difference between your core values and your satellite. And we're looking for three to four. The reason it's three to four is that it's memorable because um, I can't remember a list of 10 things. Uh, it's memorable, it's meaningful, and it's manageable. So I can use three to four to reflect on and make decisions. A list of 10, I I can't remember them. Yeah. And so therefore it's not very useful. Um, and also I'd trade them off anyway. I would always, freedom is my top value, trade it off for everything. Mm. Um, so you, you once you have that clarity about your core values, then you that's where your confidence comes from to yeah. use them to make the decisions. To what extent are values the same as kind of needs? Because we've used, we, we've used the word need quite a lot. Mm. And, yeah, I think they're very similar. I mean, I think actually sometimes I think the word values can get in the way. You know, it can feel a bit self-developmenty. Yeah. Like, I think there are some people like, who... Find your values. Yeah, Find yeah. your values exercise. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you call it a need, it's like, I have a yeah. need for freedom. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I, I never... It's really funny language. Like, we know language is really important. It's why, you know, we talk about confidence. It's why we talk about squiggly. Where we know language is very sticky. But also, I think sometimes language can just get in the way. Um, and, you know, you can talk about your values without ever saying the word values. Like, I might just say to you, like, if you're my manager, <clears throat> I might just say to you, one of the things that's really important to me is that I feel like I'm getting a lot of wins along the way. Like that is my definition of achievement. But I haven't mentioned the word values. I haven't even mentioned the word achievement. Mm. I've just taken what that word means to me and shared it with you in a mm. discussion maybe about my my development or what I'm doing in the company. And so if you want to call it needs, call it needs. If you don't want to call it I you, like you must like one of the things that motivates me is um one of the things that I want from my work is yeah. like like it's all getting at values. the same sort of Yeah, thing. just nice. get rid of it if it's getting in your way of talking about it. Damn, that's really good. Um, 
how can you be sure that your values are not being influenced by external sources? Hmm. Um, <laughs> my, um, I'm laughing because my uh, the first time my business partner reflected on her values, she was working in Canary Wharf and she did them. I think she said it's like on the 23rd story of like a building in Canary Wharf, Wharf where she was working in banking and she did all the exercises uh, and she came out with very... Uh, I'm just going to call them Canary Wharf type values. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. It was all like achievement and it was all very like one a one-sided version of her and a manager called her on it because I think she took, she was like, I've done it. Here's my work. Here are my values. I've sat in this room on my own looking out over London and these are my values. And her manager was like, oh, that's surprising. I see other things in you. Like you light up in other situations. This seems to only be one aspect of you. Um, and Sarah's like, oh, and then she went away and and reflected on it a little bit more in a different place. Um, and the words that came out were much more nuanced and much more reflective of all, all the things that she is and all the things that motivates her. So I think that is um, an example that we can be influenced by the environment that we're doing this in, the people that we might be doing it with. And I think it's why with this one, repetition is really important. Ooh, nice. I think you should do these exercises more than once. I still come back to it. I still, um, I will still go back to uh, the career graph and I might do it for a year. You know, I mentioned doing that career graph to Henry. I might just do it for a year, like 2022, and think what were my highs and lows in 2022? And now if I reflect on the really standout points in time, the highs and the lows, what was going on in those moments, almost just as a sense check. Like, are they still, are those core values still the same core values or is something else creeping in? Has there been some significant moment that I didn't appreciate that's changed my perspective? And I've done that quite a few times and it doesn't change. For me, anyway, mm. it hasn't changed. But that's, I think this is not just a one time only, yep. I'll do this exercise and then I'm done. Like you, your situation will change. Your experiences might expand who you are. And so I think we need to come back to this. And the more you come back to it, the more you see the consistencies, the more we know that we've not been swayed by a place or a person. Mm. Love it. Um, so let's say someone figures out the core values and they're like, ah, I am not feeling these yeah. in my work. Or I'm not yeah. feeling a lot of these. What happens next? Yeah. Yeah. Um, been there. Yeah. <laughs> been there. Um, so I think the first thing for people to do, I think, is not not to panic about your sudden progression and just go, I'm leaving straight away. I think let's pause a little bit. Um, there are sometimes ways that with a conversation, you can increase the amount your values are fulfilled in a particular position. I've done that. I've, I've created roles in companies that didn't exist until I did them. Mm. So um, don't, I always think about, you know, like leaping versus learning. Lots of people leap into a new a new role. But we if we spend our career leaping without doing the learning, then it's not really a great pattern for our progression. So we just want to sit and kind of think, well, well, okay, these are my values. How do they play out? Could they play out more here? Could I have some conversations about my career and what I'm looking for from work and see whether that's possible here? And I think once we've explored those different avenues, you might get to a decision that, <laughs> I'm not in the right position, I'm not in the right company. And then at least you've got more insight that can inform your progression. So I had I had this experience where I was in an organization and I was doing pretty well on the surface that you would have said, Helen's you know, doing, doing well, but actually below the surface, I wasn't particularly happy. And I really pressed pause on it and I went back to the skills and I was like, well, what is going on here? Um, what's going on with my values, strengths, um, confidence network community, I was like, what's going on here? Um, and what I realized was, and I had several conversations and I realized I couldn't really do what I wanted to do with my development there, which was, you know, it's fine to come to that conclusion. Um, that, but then when I went to my next move, I made sure that I had some curious career conversations with people in different positions in different companies so I could understand whether they were likely to be a good fit for me. Mm. So I was getting sort of, I, so I, you know, I was like, I remember I went, I remember ultimately I went to work for Virgin and I remember saying like, how much freedom do people have in what they work on and how they work mm. because same as you, yeah. so that's so important to me. And if someone said, well, we do have processes that we have to follow and work is very, I, I'd have a flag in my brain that this probably wasn't the right place for me. Yeah. But what I heard was things like, um, oh yeah, I mean, everyone's got a side project yeah. and everyone's doing all this. And so I, I heard that this was likely to be an environment that was going to work well for me. And then, you know, you also want to make sure that 
these roles that you're going for, these companies that you're going to work in, that they need what you want to be known for. So you, if you understand what your strengths are and what you want to be known for, you really want to make sure that they actually need that. Because otherwise, you might move into a position that looks perfect on paper, yeah. but it's not it's not going to be perfect for you. Because if it doesn't need what you want to be known for, then you're not you're not going to be happy. You're doing a job that you're going to be energized by. You're not going to make the impact that you could elsewhere. Yeah. And so just spending a bit of time taking that insight using it to inform the move that we make means that we make better decisions but in the meantime because you still have these needs or whatever we're going to call you still have the values within you i would be looking for ways that they can be filled outside of work so i would be thinking okay if i can't get this here and i've tried and it's not happening Mm. that is not going to that's not going to go anywhere so are there um, communities that you can be part of that's been massively helpful for me communities and contribution outside of work has been hugely helpful because um, you know if I can be a trustee for a charity then my values for achievement and growth are fulfilled in slightly different ways and if I can you know contribute to uh, communities and part of lots of different communities the energy that I need which means positivity and proactivity to me I get a lot of that from those communities so I uh, contribution and communities have worked well for me when in my career in the moment my values haven't been as fulfilled as I might like them to be we've talked about values yeah what about strengths what about strengths so um yeah you call them super strengths I think yeah so we call them super strengths and I think actually since we wrote the squiggly career because obviously we are we are talking to people about this stuff all the time like a part of our business is helping people with squiggly skills so I think our understanding um, is evolving all the time and I think one of the things that for me and strengths that's actually changed the way I think about them since we wrote the book is um, uh, this idea that strengths start with the things that you're good at Oh, okay. Uh, I think there's like so this is a little bit of a bit of a Hello. trap here. Right. Anti Cal um, Newport yeah. yeah. So most people will say a strength is something that you're good at and yeah. you know, a super strength is something that you then become great at. You invest in it, you become brilliant at it, become known for it. Um I think the starting point for that is wrong. So the things the strengths being the things you're good at. Um actually strengths are the things that give you energy. Ooh, in the okay. work that you do, nice. um, even if you're not great at them yet. So when people think they have to be good at something or they have to be great at it for it to be a strength, they start sort of dismissing it and they go, well, I'm not as good as Ali as it, so it can't be a strength because obviously it's your strength, but I'm not as good as you. So it's not, it can be my strength. And you get into all this stuff. So if we just, if our starting point for strengths is just strengths are the things that give us energy, it's a kind of easier starting point. It's the weakness thing I just want to really reflect on for a little bit. So weaknesses are the things you do that take your energy away when you do them even if you are good at them. Nice. And that's the bit that I want to hold. Okay. So weaknesses, things you do, take energy away when you do them, even if you are good at them. Because the the issue that I see a lot is that people have things that they're good at. Like we all have, like, people, we've got a list of abilities, right? There's things we've learned to do, some things are natural talents, but not all of those things give us energy at work. And it is a real issue for people's development when the thing that they are good at they find draining to do, but other people see it as a strength and then they can't get out of a situation where they have to keep doing it. It's it's a real trap for their career. And what we have to start doing is make sure the things that give us energy that we want to be known for, that that stuff stands out and that we are not defined by the work that we find draining to do. Now, you, you can't just stop doing it overnight. So let's say somebody's like, oh my gosh, that is a revelation. I spend 80% of my time doing spreadsheets and I hate it. That like you can't suddenly go, I'm never doing a spreadsheet again. Delete. Yeah. Um, because your manager's probably going to get really frustrated with you and that's not going to help us build the relationships we need to succeed. Um, but what we are aiming for is no more than 20% of our time on that kind of work. Um, like, let's just be honest. We all have things that we find draining to do. We definitely don't want to be defined by it. We definitely don't want to spend all our time doing it. But it is probably still going to be a bit of your role. So yeah. 20%, no more than that. Um, because we need to put most of our effort and energy into making those strengths stand out that we want to be known for. Mm. But also just get good enough at it. Like you don't need to be amazing at it. Like sometimes it's okay to be good enough at things. So spreadsheets, for example, just just get good enough at it so it doesn't get in your way. And definitely don't spend more than 20% of your time doing it. Because if we can spend more time on the strengths, things that give us energy, that becomes really self-fulfilling in a squiggly career. We want to make sure that those things we want to be known out uh, for stand out because the more we can do that goes right back to what we were talking about, about becomes part of your brand, gets bigger and better. Other people associate with you. They come to you for more of what you want to be good at. Yeah. Um, that's where we want to get to. Nice. That's a really good way of thinking about it. It's almost a, sh- a shame the word is strengths and weaknesses because it's like, 
drainers and energizers yeah i mean kind again, of back thing. To language. Yeah. maybe we just maybe strengths it, 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 i often find that people feel like they've done strengths and yeah. that can be a bit of a barrier like mm. a mental barrier they become quite fixed and go oh i've done a strengths course yeah. you're like okay <laughs> like and, and, and how much are you using in your job well, i don't know but i can tell you what's on my strengths profile yep. i'm like okay but it's just you know all those reports and tools and things they're just an input yeah. It's it's like what we do with the awareness. Sarah, my business partner, I were always talking about it's awareness and action. Mm. Doesn't matter how many forms you fill in, how many online surveys you take, how many courses you go on. If it's just a load of awareness, it's not really doing anything different for your development. So with strengths, I think we really we've got to put it into action. We've got to make those strengths stand out. We've got to stretch them in different situations. Yeah. We're going to take a very quick break from the podcast to introduce our sponsor, Brilliant.org. I've been using Brilliant for a few years now, and it's a fantastic online platform for courses in maths and science and computer science. Now, one of my life philosophies is that we should all endeavor to be lifelong learners if we want, because it's good for the mind, it's good for the body, it's good for our general happiness and health. And Brilliant is a perfect resource from this because you can really level up your own thinking in terms of maths and science and computer science without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on extra degrees or extra courses. Now, the courses on Brilliant are actually great because they take what could be dry topics in maths and science and computer science, and they turn them into really interesting, interactive and enjoyable kind of experiences where you learn a little bit and then you apply it in practice and then you learn a bit more and then you put it into practice. And it's almost like the system that we used to use in our tutorials back when I was at university at Cambridge, where you would learn a little thing and then you'd be paired with a world-class expert in the thing and they'd be asking you questions and you'd be kind of figuring it out together rather than being spoon-fed information like we're normally taught in school. Each lesson on Brilliant is broken up into 15-minute bite-sized chunks. And so wherever you are in your day, you can find a little bit of time and you can go on the app and you can level up your brain rather than scrolling social media or whatever the the default activity might be. And it's pretty cool as well because they're constantly updating the library of courses. For example, they've recently released a course introduction to algebra. And this is like a visual representation of algebraic thinking. Now I thought I understood algebra because I did maths in school, but actually the way that Brilliant explains it with kind of the stories and the puzzles and the interactive exercises as you go along, has really given me a new understanding of algebra that I just didn't have before. And that maybe you would need to do like a maths degree to actually get that grasp of what algebra actually is and why it's so important. So if any of that sounds up your street and you'd like to level up your thinking and your knowledge in maths or science or computer science, then head over to brilliant.org forward slash deep dive. And the first 200 people to click that link, which will be in the show notes and in the video description as well, will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring this episode. And let's get right back to the podcast. There's a rule in medicine, which is that there's no point doing a blood test if uh, the results are not going to change the management plan. <laughs> and it's like, you could do all the blood tests you like and spend like tens of thousands of pounds on all the fancy blood tests, but if it's not going to change anything, then yeah. like, what's, what's the point? It's yeah. Like, you know. And I think, again, and that, it could sound a bit brutal. Like yeah. it could sound a bit like, well, you can fill it in, but you've got to do something about it. But it's, it's true. I think the thing that makes it a bit less brutal is, is when people understand the why. Like, why is this going to be better for me? Well, if, if you are willing to take that awareness about strengths and put it into action, you, you'll be more energized by the work that you're doing. And you spend so much of your time at work. Do you, do you not want to be energized by it? You'll also have a bigger impact right? because you're going to do the work that you find energy that you're going yeah. to get better at. Yeah. And so... I think sometimes we do have to connect people with the why. Yeah. Otherwise, it's all just a bit theoretical, like invest in your strengths and succeed in a career. Like it's it's like, but why why does it matter to you? And if we can like work with the why at an individual level, we can often find the motivation to do something different to what someone's probably doing today. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, I'm I'm kind of like annoyed at myself because this is like the exact thesis of my book, uh, which we've just sent to the copy editor. And I'm like, oh, I should have mentioned something about strength. <laughs> oh, they love it when you go back and you add more things yeah. in. They really enjoy that. <laughs> I tried so hard to cut it down. It's like it was 120,000, now it's 65,000 words. And I'm like, <sighs> you're so right. I need to add in a bit. Because like the whole of part one is what are the things that energize you? And mm -hmm. how can we apply them to our work? Because the title is Feel Good Productivity. Ah, oh, love like, it. You know, the way we become more productive is not by trying to manage our time. It's by trying to regenerate our energy. Yeah. And if close to everything we do in our work can be energizing, it means you have way more energy at work. As a result, you're way more productive and you feel great. And then you get home and you have way more energy to do other things, it's, like it's, hang out with your family and shit. Like, it's so true. I remember yeah. when I started Squiggly Careers as a side project. So I was at Virgin. Uh, I just had my first child, Henry, and I just started an MBA and I just started a side project. Oh. And pretty much everyone around me was like, 
that is madness. Mm. Like, what? What? Are you, why are you adding this into that mix? You're going to exhaust yourself. And it was a lot. I'm not going to say it wasn't a lot. It was a lot. But the thing is, I would leave my work, my job at Virgin, and I would go and run a squiggly skills session. And honestly, I would get there about seven o'clock, and I would probably start a little bit tired because I'd already done a day at yeah. Virgin. And um, goodness knows what time my little boy got up in the morning and yeah. study was on my mind. Um, and so I did start a little bit tired. But that session would finish by half past eight, and I went home. I remember I used to go on the train. I'd get my lunch for the, the dinner from the station and eat at the train. And I was so energized nice. because that strength, that talent I wanted to be known for was about, you know, helping people learn, develop and grow in their career specifically. And when I did it, I just, I, and I, I just loved it. And it gave me so much energy. And I would take that into my job at Virgin the next day and it would come with me and it would affect how I led my team. And that energy just continued. And so I'm not saying everyone should do all of that stuff that I did because it was hard, but I really saw the benefit of using a strength that gives yeah. you energy in more situations and that actually side projects, some people I think they see side projects as a competition for the day job. You know, like you're yeah. doing that side project because I never saw it that way. I saw a side project as being a different way that I stretched my strength that meant that I got better in both positions. I was a much better manager in Virgin because of my side project. It didn't compete with that career. Oh, nice. That's just, again, put a puzzle piece in my in my head where. I, the, the, OK, so two things. One, there's there's a bit of a narrative that side projects are hustle culture and yeah. like, oh, you know, it's it's hard enough to get get to the end of the day of work. And now you're telling everyone that they should yeah. have a side project. Work just more. yeah, just like chill out and watch Netflix <laughs> and like it's, it's OK to have a relaxing bath and stuff. <laughs> and I've always been like not a fan of this particular narrative. Because for me, the side project has always been incredibly energizing. Mm. And people would often ask back when I was working in medicine, they're like, oh, you, you know, you were working all day as a doctor. That's pretty demanding. And then you get home and you just make these YouTube videos. And then how, how, how do you do all that? And honestly, it's because like, I found ways to make the day job more energizing by figuring out what were the things that energized me and actively incorporating more of them into the thing. And like realizing I get a lot of energy from just hanging out with the nurses and just having a cup of tea and chatting about whatever. So it's just, I mean, let me actively make an effort to do that because it gives me energy. And then I get home and I make a YouTube video and that would give me energy. And it's just like this energy flywheel continues. And then like I was I was never exhausted. I was never burnt out in the job. And yet a lot of my my friends and colleagues who would work all day, get home and then chill, the chill was not actually regenerating the energy. Yes. It was scrolling yeah. through social media, watching Netflix Yeah. in a way that if, if you're really honest, like, yeah, like I get to the end of a Netflix sesh and I feel drained rather than energized. Yeah. Whereas a side project, I feel energized. Great. Let's keep going. I think <laughs> there's... um. There's a thing about active rest that I find quite interesting. Mm. Alex Pang talks about it in um, in his book. And you know, the, I always think there's like a scale. And on one on one side, you've got kind of restful, we're asleep, we're in a great level yeah. of sleep. And then on the other side, we've got restless, where we're trying to do way too much stuff and we're multitasking and we're scrolling. And it's sort of like a restless mind when mm. we're going through like all these things. And um, often you can't sleep at work. Like you do have to be awake to do it. So we can't just rely on sleeping mm. in our day. And we know that that restless thing isn't really working. But Alex Pang always talks about kind of this active rest thing in the middle where you're doing yeah. an activity that consumes your attention that gives you the energy back yeah, nice. and i found that really really useful because i'd always thought oh i don't want to rest because rest means doing nothing and he and he taught me that no it doesn't mean doing nothing yeah. it can mean doing something that you enjoy that you find consuming and and it turns off all the noise of everything else it turns off whatever was going on at the hospital or whatever's yeah. going on at home and in doing that thing for an hour and it could be anything right some people like doing puzzles like you know mm. your nan likes doing scrabble yeah. whatever it yeah. is like people like doing that it can be that thing but it consumes you and it gives you energy back and i think it's working out what is that thing that gives you that energy back but if it aligns with your strengths even better yeah. even better because then you know you're building that talent at the same time yeah yeah so when i was when i was recent so the penultimate chapter of my book is is about recharging and so i did a load of research into the papers and stuff around what is it that makes certain en activities energizing and there was a really interesting meta-analysis they did where they sort of did all this and they came up with like four things it's like if the thing that you're doing has these four things chances are it's going to be energizing or feel recharging and with a bit of shoehorning i turned it into the mnemonic uh calm c-a-l-m so c4 i think is competence so if you're good at the thing, yeah. it will more likely to be energizing. A for autonomy, yeah. if you feel like you have ownership. L for liberty, uh, it's a bit of a shoehorn, but it's like <laughs> basically sort of sufficiently distinct from your day job or the, what you normally do, Yeah, which is why like Ed Sheeran paints rather than does music as his hobbies because yeah. it's like music is now his job and stuff. And then M for mellow, again, a bit of a shoehorn, but uh, things that are not so like high energy 
but are like th- that 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 feeling of calm and mellow that we get from doing things mm-hmm. doing certain activities those sort of c a l m activities tend to be the ones that recharge us and then the actual words they used in the study were a bit different but it, was, it wasn't nice mnemonics so it was like let's do some shoehorning but i think people yeah. don't <laughs> often prioritize it because they think it's it's that's not important but actually the benefit of doing those things makes all the other things that you do in your day kind yeah. of more more efficient and effective yeah so how so i guess we're saying someone can ask themselves what are the things that i do in my work that bring me energy and yep. what are the things that i do in my work that drain my energy yeah and then it's like oh crap like 60% of what i do drains my energy what what happens next so we need to as well as that oh crap realization we also need to do the like the oh yes realization like the okay so those are the things that give me energy and um, i mean i would just like look in your diary your, your like look at your days and the meetings that you've been in and the moments in your week and like just pick out when were the highest energy moments and what was the strength i was actually using in that situation like maybe you were researching or building relationships or like whatever you're doing um, and i would write a list of those words and then from that list i would pick no more than three no more than three mm. i might even just go with one to begin with to be honest and the, the the picking that you're doing is thinking of these words here these strengths that give me energy what do i actually want to be known for i rarely see people make that choice Ooh. rarely see someone go do you know what? i actually that is what i want to be known for if people are talking about me and i'm not in the room that that is the thing that i want them to say about me and i think the risk of people not making that choice is that they leave this to chance you know you might say one thing about me and you know sarah might say another and my manager that i work with a virgin might say another and so then my my strengths are quite inconsistent you know different people are saying different things about me in different places i'm not really building my brand in a consistent way yeah. whereas if i take control of this if i go i want to be known for career development and that is exactly what i said 10 years ago not known for career development known for marketing i made a choice because it was a thing that gave me the most energy in my day like beyond the job title that i had regardless of the company that i worked in the thing that i loved was like helping people with their careers yeah to the extent that i got some feedback when i was at microsoft from someone in my team who said i'd spent more time trying to understand the people that worked for me than i had the company that i worked in and i was like that is harsh but true <laughs> harsh but true and actually that's just helen you know mm. it's harsh true and helen and um but i thought it was a very it was a very clear feedback to me um and that's because that's the thing that i love doing so you've got to make that choice once you've made that choice you can start to really look at that strength and see okay well what situations am i using it in today who and where could i use that strength with more and and that becomes a really intentional thing like i literally thought okay if i want to be known for career development what am i going to do differently in my one to ones what am i going to do differently in my meetings what departments could i offer that skill to i could run a lunch and learn um until it just becomes just, just part of who you are because you're just it's just how you're thinking about the things that you put yourself forward for mate this is so good i feel i'm just getting so many dopamine hits and insights like oh, everything you're saying is just so sick <laughs> wow um what do i want to be known for like yeah that's that ties into the whole like personal brand, professional reputation-y type stuff, which I know gives some people a bit of an allergic <laughs> response. Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh. yeah. Um, but it's so true. It's like, and, and you know, the the thing I always say to people without really thinking about it too hard is like, you have a personal brand whether you like it or not. Because <laughs> yeah. a personal brand is just a professional reputation. It's the thing that people say about you or think about you when you're not in the room. And I guess what you're saying is like, let's think what do we actually want that to be and yes. actually work towards it yeah work towards, and i think two two kind of uh things i think are important here mm. it takes time so i couldn't come away from here and think do you know what i want to be known for being i don't know an expert in what neuroscience or something like that i could be like yeah. i could make that decision that's my choice but it doesn't just happen overnight you know it takes it takes learning it takes opportunities it takes experience but i'm just driving that for my development so i think you it's it is a choice that you can make and you can definitely change the direction of your development because of it but it does take a little bit of time mm. and then the other thing that i would say is you can change your mind <laughs> you can definitely change your mind sometimes i think people think oh but what if i don't want to be known for this forever or it like, fine fine just know that you can make a choice and you can change your mind but that it will take time to do it it's also why i say with the five skills pick the one that feels relevant for you right now because this does this does take time reflecting on your values takes time um and but you're at work for a long time so we've got time to do all this stuff we don't have to rush it we just have to start like where we are with the skill that we need most right now yeah and just like minor course corrections along the way yeah um nice 
That's great. Okay, so we've talked about strengths, um, super strengths, energizing strengths, values, uh, and, and we talked about values. Um, you talk about confidence. Mm. So what's the role of confidence in navigating a squiggly career? Confidence is the key. Confidence is the key. I often think I'm not supposed to have favorite values. I don't know if I really have, but I do think that, that um, so I'm not, it's, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to have favorite skills. I think values is at the core of a squiggly career because if, if you're going to have a career as individual as you are, you've got to know what motivates and drives you. So I think values is at the core and I think confidence is the key because if we are going to get people to take action, to do something different, to have a conversation, to make a difficult decision, all that stuff, they've got to have the confidence to do it. Or otherwise it's all awareness. It's all nice, nice in theory. <laughs> and so we've got to get the awareness and the action and the confidence is the key for that. And they, people have so many beliefs that hold them back. We we call them confidence gremlins because you, you, you know, you really get into the territory of psychology here and limiting belief and that can feel quite uncomfortable for people and quite theoretical language. Yeah. So we often, we talk about these as confidence gremlins and we see some very common confidence gremlins that hold people back, uh, like not knowing enough, for example, uh, a need to be liked. Um, people have some limiting beliefs about their age like I'm not old enough or I'm too old, like both of them. Uh, people have um, confidence gremlins related to uh, failure. Like I can't fail, if I if I fail, I'm a failure. So this confidence gremlin about they can't possibly fail. Um, people have confidence gremlins about particular abilities as well that really get in the way of their growth. Like I don't, I'm not good at numbers, yeah. like any, any numbers, <laughs> not any numbers at all, I'm just, they just say it. Often started at school when they weren't in the top set and then it's just this, this little gremlin has grown and then they're at work and they go, oh, I can't do numbers. Or um, uh, presenting, that's another very common confidence gremlin where people are like, oh, I, don't, I can't, I'm not a good presenter. And so they, what they do is they stop sharing their thoughts and their ideas because presenting is such a big way that we communicate in lots yeah. of companies. So I think with with confidence, the, the, the first thing that's really important very often is for people to know that they've got a gremlin and know that everybody else has too. Because so often we're like, oh, oh, I just think I'm, I just think I don't know enough and I'm going to get found out. But like most people have those kind of thoughts and it doesn't really matter how senior people are or what position they're in. Most people have some kind of confidence gremlin that gets in the way of their growth. And I often find when we're doing like squiggly skill sessions that it's, it's, it's this moment of like realization. I'll be in a room, I was in a room recently with them. Um, uh, a group of lawyers uh, and I was thinking well, are they going to be are they going to be open it was a group of lawyers talking about confidence and I was like are they going to be open to talking about this and we talked about the confidence gremlins and I got everyone to um, put their hands up every time they identified with one of the gremlins um, and they were putting their hands up in the room they were all obviously looking at each other in the room and then we went through all the 10 most common confidence gremlins and I said and, and what, what does this all make you think what, you've just seen each other put your hands up what does it make you think and they um, they were like oh we've all got gremlins and then they all sort of laughed and then it was like this relief it was like oh i'm i'm not the only one they're obviously in very successful senior positions where credibility was important so i think admitting that they had these thoughts was quite a big thing mm. but once we do it you've you've opened the door then you've opened the door and gone okay we have these thoughts and i'm not alone and it's okay to have them but now we've got to cage the gremlin so you've almost got to let the gremlin out in order to cage it because when the gremlin's in your head it's in control of you. It's stopping you speaking up in meetings. It's stopping you applying for positions. It's stopping you challenge someone if you don't agree with what they think. Once we have let the gremlin out, we can more consciously cage it, which means that I can speak up in that meeting. Now, it's not gonna be easy. I'm not gonna love it because it's a confidence gremlin for me, but I am now in control of my gremlin and I can do things that I wouldn't have done before because that the gremlin was driving my development and now, I'm in the driving seat and the gremlin's still there because it's very hard to kill it, but you are you are more in control. And that's the journey we're trying to get people on is, what is your gremlin? Let's get it out and then let's cage it for you. And there's, you know, there's a set of activities that people can do that make that gremlin smaller and less significant. But I, I always say like, it's probably not going to go away. It's sort of your gremlin's a part of you and it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep popping up, but we're just going to get better at putting it back in its cage. What are these um, common confidence gremlins? Um, oh, I have to remember off my head now. Uh, so things like um, a fear of not knowing enough, a fear of not being good enough, a fear of not being liked, a fear of failure, uh, age-related confidence gremlin, the fear of presenting, the fear of senior people. That's an interesting one. Some people like just really fear senior people, yeah. have a whole different identity when a senior person's in the room. Uh, one of the ones that I find funny, and I hate saying this because confidence gremlins aren't that funny, but it's just... Um, it's a fear of uncontrolled bodily reactions, which sounds, mm. which I find it funny because it's a funny thing, but basically 
Some people have a confidence gremlin about how their body reacts when they are put under pressure. So they might blush, for example, you know, like they might get a blush on the neck or they might perspire or maybe their hands might shake a little bit in a situation or maybe they might stutter, all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's not particularly something they can control because it's driven by the adrenaline that's created by that situation that they're in. But for them, the confidence gremlin is more what other people will think of them if they see that happening. And so because they're so worried about what other people will think if they see their neck going red or all this stuff, they don't put themselves in a position where that's that outcome is possible, which means they don't put themselves in a position where they might be under pressure, which means they play it safe in their career. And so it becomes really, they're like, oh, I won't, I'm never gonna present on a stage because I blush and then people think I don't know what I'm talking about. And it's like, the thing with confidence gremlins is often when you go, uh, and get some feedback from other people, they see that situation very differently. Like yeah. our confidence governments create a real filter that we look through that other people don't see uh, in the same way. So they might say, you know, they might have gone, the pre- they might do the presentation, they're blushing and they're thinking, oh, that was awful. And then they might go to a colleague and saying, you know, what's the one thing you remember from my time when I was talking on the stage? And the person might say, oh, um, like you were so clear and articulate or, oh, I thought you looked like so smiley. And like everything that's played back is nothing to do with this blushing that for that person was like a beacon on a stage. Like they were this big red lighthouse, but no one else saw it. Um, and so often it's very useful to get somebody else's perspective on the situation where your gremlin really, really stood out to you because it helps you to realize that you're it is changing the way that you're seeing the world of work um, and that other people are not seeing and experiencing what you are. And again, it's just about going, my gremlin is creating this. It's not It's not the reality. It's my experience of it because my gremlin's in the driving seat. And it's those little moments of insight that help us realize that, oh, we can do something about this. This is a choice. This is something I control. This is not what's going on in everyone else's world. Let's move on to networks. Yes. So what's the role of networks in Squeaky Queen? Uh, oh, networks are so important. They they will help you go further. You'll get where you want to go faster because people can see opportunities you can't see for yourself. So in a squiggly career, we're talking about people de- developing in different directions, people having more choice over where they take their career. But so many of those doors will be opened by other people. And so we need the relationships with people who can see positions and opportunities we can't see for ourselves and so we've got to build that and it isn't just about it isn't just about new jobs it is about learning if you know the often you know people think learning is going on a course but so much of learning happens through conversation and in fact it lasts a lot longer like when you look at like how we Mm. you know learning lasts in our brain discussion with somebody else is significantly more effective than just watching a course. Mm. So our community is a source of opportunities. Our community is a source of learning, is a a source of feedback, Mm. is an enabler for our growth. Um, But lots of people, I think, struggle with building a network because they think about it as sort of people knowing people. How many people do I know? Mm. How many followers have I got? How many connections have I got on LinkedIn? Like that that is like the sign of a good network. and that's not that meaningful. That doesn't mean you've got a good network. You might be connected to a lot of people, but it doesn't mean you've got a good community around your career. A, a good community around your career is one that is active and effective. And so we think about it as people helping people. Because if I'm helping you, that's active. Mm. Like, here's some help. It's an active thing. Mm. And you've been helped. It is effective. So when we think about people helping people as the basis for this, mm. it starts to get a lot better. And and two, there's two big benefits of it as well. The first is, People like helping people. Mm. Like it's a human trait. Like you get the helpers high. Yeah. It's, it's like proven that I, if I help you, it makes me feel good. Mm. Um, and so when people feel awkward about building relationships, starting with how you can help and what you've got to give, it, it just feels nicer. Yeah. But then if you look at research from people like Adam Grant and his work on give and take, givers get more. So I actually get more back by helping other people, Mm. I get more in return anyway. And this becomes a really self-fulfilling way of building your network. So it starts people helping people and then thinking about, and what have I got to give? And you you do just have to trust, we kind of think of it as career karma. You do just have to trust that the good stuff comes back. Like you can't treat this as a transaction. Yep. So I can't think, oh, Ali's writing a book. I'll help him with that. Cause then Ali can help me set something on YouTube. It's not, it's not, I don't think we want to go into this in a transactional way. Yep. You just think, what do I know that can help you to grow? Like I literally go around thinking that. And when I say I literally go around, it, not to everybody that I meet in every minute of every day. <laughs> I think you do, 
also need to be intentional about the relationship you're building for your career. Um, there is an element of randomness, which is like this weak tie stuff. So the the kind of helping people who you don't have a big connection with at the moment because you never know where that's going to go. But there is also a lot of very intentional building of relationships with people that you think, well, I know that person could open that door for my development. So if I think about how I can help them, then perhaps in the future mm. that might come back. But I'm not I'm not trading. I'm not transacting with help. Mm. Nice. Uh, you talk about the three Ds of networking. Do you know what? Yeah, there's a while ago since I've done that in that yeah. book. Yeah, we don't. The, the we talk about sort of distance, uh, donating, and a diversity. Um, so I think the the reason these are important. Uh, so distance is some of your relationships are going to be very close to you. So um, my business partner. She's, she's super, super close to me, super important in, in, my, in my kind of, uh, my network. Um, she's very close to my context. But sometimes there are people that are further away from where you are that can have a different perspective and can have, um, you know, see things that you can't see in your world. So yeah. kind of distance is quite important. When you're looking at people, you don't basically want your network to be made up of people you see every day. No, we want to kind of some difference there. Um, donating. So we want to make sure that we are giving because then we will kind of get lots mm. back. Um, and then we want lots of difference. So you don't want an echo chamber of people just like you. Um, and when we're looking at sort of difference and diversity, there are four roles that we recommend people to build into their network. So, and I think everyone should have these. I don't think everyone's got them, but I think everyone, everyone should have them. So the first role would be a mentor. So somebody, and this this gets really overcomplicated. I just think a mentor is somebody who has done what you would like to do. Yeah. Like, that you could have one meeting. Like you could be my mentor because you've done something I want to do. We've had one meeting, and we might we might not meet again, but you mm. still mentored me. It doesn't have to be this relationship that endures for the rest of yours and my career. So it's just someone who's done what you want to do, and they give you advice. Easy. Um, second one is a peer. So a peer is someone who is going through what you are going through. Um, really helpful to accelerate your development because I can talk to you about what I'm doing and you're doing it too and you get it and we can help each other. Like Sarah Ellis has been my peer for 20 years. I happen now to work with her, but my I would not be where I am if it wasn't for her. She's mm. accelerated my growth massively. Um, the next one is a sponsor. So a sponsor is someone who can advocate for you. So they have got access and influence over an area you're interested in. So you've got to just think, well, what am I interested in? Am I interested in writing a book? Am I interested in starting a podcast? Am I interested in that position and that team over there? Like yeah. who's got access and influence? That person is, a, is it could be a brilliant sponsor for you. Um, you can't ask for sponsorship. So I can't just say, can you say brilliant things about me on that team over there? Yeah. That sponsor needs to see me at my best. So when yeah. we talked about strengths, we want that person to see our strengths, like really mm -hmm. see us in action. They're more, much more likely to support us then. And then the fourth role is a coach. Now, uh, this doesn't have to be a professional coach. They are quite expensive to have a career coach, Not definitely not accessible to everybody. Th I think it's better to think of this as someone who's got a coaching approach, which means they're very good at asking questions. Right. And, and they're very good at just stopping talking to let you think. Yeah. And they might follow with another question, but what they are not doing is answering the question. That's for you to do. Yeah. And so if you know people who've got that ability, they're really, really helpful to have in your career community because they'll help you think differently. And so as well as like the three Ds, I actually think those four roles, again, you know, I said that we are evolving our thinking all the time. We wrote the book. Well, the book was published in 2020. And since then we've trained like almost 200,000 people. And in it was almost like in each one of the conversations I have, I get some feedback on how effective tools are. Yeah. And they're, they're kind of, we're always evolving them. We're always seeing what sticks. We're always seeing what's useful. And I think I'm finding that those four roles, people really focusing on those are one of the most useful ways they can build their community. The principal people helping people, but the practical focusing on those four roles. Sick. Um, one thing people always ask is, any tips for finding a mentor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask for one. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes do get emails being like, "Will, will you be my mentor?" Yeah, it's like random people. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> don't, I'm pretty sure that's not how it works. Yeah, but, yeah. Don't yeah. don't ask for one. And um, first of all, I think you need to work out what it is you want to learn. So, um, I might say one of the things that I want to learn about is uh, commercial skills or investing. Actually, it's one of the things that I want to learn about. I think amazing if our um, my business were thinking about creating an investment fund so that other people who are doing stuff in the career space can we can help them to grow because yeah. we you know, more than us just operate in this space and we want to create an ecosystem of, of squiggly career support. So, um, but I've not done that before. I don't know how to do it. So for me, um, who's done what I would like to do? 
uh, a good mentor would be somebody who's maybe built some kind of investment fund mm. and they've got some experience of doing that from scratch and all everything that goes with it. So now I know what I want to learn, yeah. I can think about who. I might think about who do I know in my network that's got the knowledge that I need. And maybe maybe I don't know anybody. Um, so I could go to somebody else that's in my network and say, do you know anyone who? Mm. Like, we don't always know everyone we might need to know. So it's fine to ask someone, but you can be very specific. I'm not saying can you introduce me to Ali? I'm saying one of the things that I'd really like to learn is about investment funds. Do you know anyone who? And so it's 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 about the what before we mm. get to the person. Because otherwise I think people just ask senior people to be their mentors because it looks impressive. Uh, and we've got to be specific to be genuine. And then when we're making that request for that person's time, I think the way that we articulate that request is really important. So this is where we get to the kind of the why I'm coming to you. So let's say you have got investment experience that I would benefit from. I might say, one of the things that I'm really focused on is amazing gifts, growth and impact. And one of the ways that I think we can do that is by investing in other people's businesses. I know that that is something that you have done before. And I think you've got a lot of knowledge that I can learn from. Would you be prepared to spend half an hour with me just sharing the insights that you got so that I can use that to inform the the things that I'm planning to do? And yes. <laughs> like, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> if I'd just gone to you and said, yeah. will you be my mentor? Like it's, that's like uh, a recurring yeah, commitment on my time. Exactly. I don't have time. It's, like, come on, like, who are you? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Who are you? How much time do you think I actually have? Like, yeah. like there's no, it's too hard. Mm. We don't want to make it hard for people to help us. We're people helping people. I want to make it as easy as possible for you to help me. Now, you and I might have that meeting and that might be all I need. Like, you might just be like, here's five things that I think you should look at. See you later. And I, and you still help me, right? It's still been useful. Or you and I might have that meeting and there might have been some kind of connection. Yeah. You're like, oh, I find what you're doing is really interesting. I'd actually quite like to see how it goes and how it grows. And I'm like, and you know loads more than I've got out of you in 30 minutes. Yeah. And because we've got that sense of connection, that conversation is likely to continue. Now, this is really, really important for the mentee. The mentee needs to follow up. If, if the mentee wants that conversation to continue, so if I'm like, I really want to see you again because there's a lot more that I could learn from you. It's really important that after that meeting, not same day, like give it a few days, actually do something with what that person has shared, follow up with the mentor. So go back to the mentor, say, thank you so much for your time. Hmm. As a result of this conversation, these are the things that I've already done. Um, I really appreciate it. And I would love to continue the conversation if you're up for another meeting in the future. And um, because the mentor gets two boosts in their brain. Hmm. The first boost is when they helped. Like when you gave me help, mm. you're like, oh, made me feel good. Yeah. Help is high. People like helping people. Second boost is when you know the impact of your efforts. Yeah. So when I play it back to you, you're like, oh, that was a good use of my time. She's done something with what I gave her and therefore you're much more likely to give it again. Yeah. So I think if we can approach mentoring a bit like that, it's, I think it's better for both parties. Yeah, and the word mentor is like never even used. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just, I just I help and knowledge and yeah. like that's more. Where yeah, I think people under, un, underappreciate because I, I feel like a limiting belief a lot of people have is, oh, why would, the, why would this, pers this important person want to talk to me about the thing? I don't realize that like, if you approach it in the right way, then it's just, it's just nice to, everyone loves sharing what they've learned and for someone to be interested in that. And for that person, especially to then take action on applying the thing, you're like, oh, sick. Yeah. And you might even become friends. <laughs> and back to, back to confidence gremlins, maybe they've got a confidence gremlin about senior people that's getting in the way of that. So you might have to unpick the confidence gremlin and say, you know, they might say, um, the, the limiting belief might be a senior person will never make time for me. Um, and it might, the limitless belief is, um, I've got some, uh, I can help the senior person to see, um, I don't know, to see this as a different situation or something, yeah. you know, like I've, I've got some insight that they actually could help them because yeah. they can't see this situation from the position that they're in. And so, I, so much of this stuff is tied together. That's why there's five skills. I love it. All right, skill number five, yes. future possibilities. Yes, what would you like to know? Um, what are what do you mean by future <laughs> possibilities? Like, and um, like just, so what we are yeah. trying to do here with this skill is to help people to be proactively curious about their career. And if I just go kind of right back to the ladder for a moment, what the ladder often leads to is people not being proactively curious. They're actually much more reactive about how they manage their development. And the most proactive thing that they probably do is they might make a plan. They might make a plan. So, that's, so I get a piece of paper and I say, you know, in 2023, I'm CEO of Amazing If, and 2024, I'm going to do this. And in 2025, I'm going to do this. And that's why I might plan a, a series of roles. Mm -hmm. And then I often become quite blinkered 
covered by yeah. what I've put in front of me. Um, and I don't tend to um, explore around it. Yeah. And then the problem is when those things don't materialize, I suddenly start to get a bit stuck or a bit frustrated by it. So we're trying to get away from the idea that we can plan all this stuff. Um, we're trying to get away from people fixing their future. And so possibilities are more about career curiosity and instead of fixing things we're trying to be a bit more, bit more flexible so that's the skill here really is to be proactively curious about your career and you can do that in in, in lots of different ways um what i often suggest as a starting place here is that people um go and explore for specific possibilities like and i don't mean apply for jobs that's the exact opposite of what i'm saying i'm saying I want you to go and talk to people and get closer to these career possibilities. And so four that I'd recommend people have a look at, um, the obvious career possibility. So we we all have a move that probably makes squiggly sense. Like when I was at Microsoft, it was my manager's job. Like that's what people thought I should do and it seemed sensible to do. Yeah. Um, now I run my company. The sensible move for me to make is actually just stay in my job because it's growing. My company is growing and so I will grow with it. That's mm. the, the sensible move for me to make. Um, the reason I want people to explore this one a little bit more is because a lot of people assume that because it's obvious, it's the right move for them to make. Mm. So they take on their manager's job or they go for that promotion because they've, they're they currently a junior and they should be a senior and all those kind of things. Or I just stay in my role because it's obvious that it's growing and I should stay in it. Um, and actually, maybe that role doesn't actually need what you want to be known for, the strengths. Mm. Maybe that role doesn't align with the things that really drive and motivate you back to your values. So it'll be a good fit for you if it fits with your values and strengths. If it doesn't, then it might look good on paper, but it's not going to be good for you. And so we only know that stuff when we when we talk to people who are in those positions. Maybe we find time to spend time in those meetings. We're observing it from a slightly different perspective. You know, we're kind of looking out for things. So obvious one's a good place to start. Um, ambitious possibilities, definitely worth spending a bit of time getting curious about those. So those are the ones that are interesting, but feel a bit of reach out of reach right now. Sometimes that's because it's more senior. Like nothing wrong with wanting to be more senior. Um, Sometimes it might be a sideways move. Like I might think, oh, I want to go do this thing over here. Feels a bit ambitious because I've never done that before. Mm. Um, the issue with this possibility for lots of people is because it 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 feels out of reach. They leave it for too long. Mm. They're like, oh, I'm not ready for that yet. Or you know, people are going to think that I'm being too ambitious. You know, you have to, I often hear that confidence gremlin uh, coming up from people. But the longer you leave it, the further it will always feel away. Mm. So we want people to just go and have a conversation, make a connection. Uh, get close to that context. Like the closer you get, the sooner that squiggly career possibility is going yeah. to become more of a reality. The longer you leave it, the further that one's always going to feel away. Yeah. Uh, third one are pivots. So pivot possibilities, these are fun. I like these ones. Um, so in, in ladder-like careers, we often look through our progression through the lens of a job title. That gets really limiting because it always has to sound senior and similar. Um, in squiggly careers, I want people to look at their future through the lens of their talents. So who needs what I want to be known for in my company, outside of my company, in this community, outside of this community. And then you just start going, you kind of get beyond a job title, you start matching in a very different way based yeah. on talents. That's quite, I quite like that one. And then the fourth possibility is the dream one. Lots of people discount the dream. So this is like the unconstrained career choice. Like we've all got constraints, how much we need to earn and where we need to live and what we need to know and all these kind of things. Some are very real. Um, but if you just took them away for a moment, mm. what would you do if you could do anything? Mm. Um, some people love that one. You love that, like you're nodding because mm. maybe because some of your values uh, are like, oh, yeah. some yeah. people get really scared by it. And they're yeah. like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I get people to sit with it a little bit and then think, well, well, what do you need to know? Like, let's not discount the dream. Like, why, why would we discount the dream? Like, what do you need to know about it? Um, and, and who could you find that out from? And I always find with the dream, there was a quote that really helped me. To speak what you seek until you see what you said really helped me with the dream one. Like, speak what you seek till you see what you said. So if there's something that you want to do, it is very unlikely that it's going to happen if it just exists in your head. Hmm. But if you talk about it, if you say, like, this is what I might like to do in the future, this is what I'm interested in, it is much more likely that you're going to see what you said. Because someone might know someone, or someone might be able to enable it, hmm. or someone might just support your ambition in yeah. a different way. Um, and all you've got to do is have curious career conversations about different career possibilities. And sometimes you rule them in and you go, that sounds amazing. And sometimes you rule them out and that's totally fine. Um, but what happens in the course of those conversations is you start to get closer to the possibilities and the people that are connected to them become more aware of you. And so it starts yep. enabling and the possibilities become probabilities which become positions for you in your future. That's that's the journey we're trying to go on. Love it. Um 
At the end of the book, you have uh, a thing like 100 pieces of career advice. We do. Um, just to end with, like, what are th- well, what are three of your favourites? Three, favorites? three, three. Three of your um, favourite pieces okay. of career advice. I'll be, I'll, I'll go mine, Sarah's, and Simon Sinek's. <laughs> okay, nice. so we'll okay. go with those. So mine um, uh, is to run your own race. I have found that to be a really enabling piece of career advice for me that has unhooked me from comparison and given me a lot of confidence. That's really worked for me. Uh, Sarah's is to uh, never live the same year twice. Hmm. So she's very driven by variety and um, and that really keeps her, like I think it just keeps her growing, mm-hmm. really keeps her growing. Um, and then Simon Sinek's that really stuck with me because um, he was on the podcast and I asked him for his advice and he said to, um, you don't have to have all the answers and you don't have to pretend that you do. And I thought, oh, it's quite liberating to hear somebody who is like so successful sort of admit that they don't know everything and they don't need the pressure of having yeah. to know everything and they don't have to pretend that they know everything. And I was like, oh, that's quite nice to just admit that we're all sort of work in progress and that we don't need to know everything. That, te- that takes the pressure off. So there were three, but there's, there's so many in there. And I think, you know, you, you, you read in a quote what you need right now, you know? So I think, you know, when you go through quotes, some of them... They stand out to you at different moments because of what what you need. So I think it's a chapter for me that I can go back to. And actually, my favorite ones change just because of what I need right now. Right. I think that's a great place to end this. Helen, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, Do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.